Carl Sagan has been with us frequently before. He's the uh, professor of astronomy and space sciences at Cornell and the, the director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies. And in the past, we've discussed everything from the Viking mission to outer space. But he's written a book now on a fascinating subject. It's called The Dragons of Eden, Speculations on the Evolution of Human Intelligence, which may sound heavy, but he makes it sound rather simple. Would you welcome Carl Sagan? <laughs> We were doing a, the Mensa test out here, which had uh, to do with intelligence a while, while ago. How do you define intelligence? Well, it's uh, different people differ, of course, yeah. on, uh, on what it is, but uh, you, can, you can tell often the difference between, uh, say, a man and a mouse pretty easy. And uh, that gives you a substantial <laughs> insight into what it's about. Um, I would say that, that as far as human beings are concerned, the, uh, it's our ability to put a great many facts together to understand the way the world really is, uh, and to manipulate it, to control the environment. And uh, if we, we could characterize it by how much information is in our heads, and uh, if we do it that way, we find that there's only a few other organisms on the Earth that are, that are close, dolphins and whales, great apes, our immediate uh, non-human ancestors, and, uh, and then there's a reasonably big gap to yeah. the other organisms. What kicked you off in this direction? Well, I didn't mean to write the book. It, uh, it happened. Uh, I was asked to, uh, to give a lecture uh, in uh, honor of a uh, of, uh, memorial of a man named Jacob Bronowski, who did The Ascent oh, of Man, you know? A wonderful series. Uh, and uh, I thought I would give it on a subject that was dear to his heart, how, how human beings became human. I thought it was a good opportunity for me to learn some new stuff, and I became absolutely captivated by it. I mean, it's connected with some things I'm interested in, uh, the possibility of intelligent life on right. other planets. Surely we can learn about that by finding out how intelligent life came to be here. And also, since we're all human, we're interested in how we got that way. But uh, once into it, uh, the, the thing it's just occupied two absolutely years. Absolutely fascinating book. My son, Corey, read it yesterday. Uh, I remember when I was going to school, they used to say the difference that separates the humans from the lower forms of animals was that, uh, that men knew how to use tools and made tools for their work. And then that was kind of shot down when they found out that chimpanzees and birds and other animals do make rudimentary forms of tools and apparently have the intelligence to do that. So that, that myth was gone. What does it come down to, basically? I think you said it there, that man seems to be, as far as we know, the only species that's aware of his own mortality, well, or that he's going to die, and uh, also can pass on a written history well, of what he has done yeah, to... I think that's very important. The, the idea that we have information stored outside of our bodies. Um, for most of, you, uh, of the history of life on this planet, <laughs> Uh, the organisms had almost all the information they had to deal with in their genes, hereditary information, instinct. Uh, then, about uh, maybe 100 million years ago, a little longer ago than that, there came to be a, a, a reptile that for the first time in the history of life had more information in its brains than in its genes. And uh, that was a major step, symbolically, in the evolution of life on this planet. Well, now we have an organism, us, which can store more information outside the body altogether than inside the body, and that's in uh, books and computers and television video cassettes. Uh, and that extraordinarily expands our ability to understand what's happening and, uh, and to manipulate, control our environment, uh, yeah. if we do it wisely, for, for human benefit. The, the whole idea of, uh, of what happens when you read a book I find absolutely stunning. Here, here's some product of a tree with little black squiggles on it. Right. You open it up, and inside your head, is the voice of someone speaking who may have been dead 3,000 years, and yet there he is talking directly to you. What a magical thing that is. Yeah, and then you store that, practically <coughs> all of that information, consciously or subconsciously, because as you said, as, as people get older sometimes, I think one of the interesting things is they can recall things that are way in the past, elderly people, when they reach that point, where very often they may forget something that happened just a few minutes earlier. There's a People problem. say, well, they're drifting away, but they can recall things from childhood. So it's just a problem, apparently, in accessing short-term memory. We have 
some quite different sorts of memory and the clearest distinctions between short term and long term. Uh, a waiter in a short order restaurant, restaurant or waitress uh, clearly remembers a lot of information, but for an extremely short period of time. I can't Im imagine that the waiter uh, goes home and remembers the order of a week ago last Tuesday. Uh, but yet, the total amount of information that went through was, was very large. Well, that's sh the short-term memory, and you can wipe it out. You can is remove it, it. Is it true? Of course, they're, just, they're really now just becoming, uh, the brain is so complex that they're not sure really completely how it functions. And mm -hmm. As you said, the, the weight of the brain versus the weight of the, of the person has a lot to do with it in proportion to the size of the, uh, the, like the, um, the animal. And when you say reptiles have a small uh, brain size or fish, practically nothing in relation to their body has something right. to do with it. And yet when Einstein died, I think they did a... Uh, yes, and they couldn't find anything They couldn't remarkable. find anything remarkable about the brain. It wasn't any particularly larger than anybody else's brains. It didn't have any more convolutions in it or anything? So, I mean, I think there's a lesson to that, and uh, it's a reasonably important one. <clears throat> the lesson is that uh, what distinguishes uh, one human being from another in terms of intelligence is probably very little to do with the heredity and a, an enormous amount to do with the environment. Well, how do you explain that? I didn't mean to interrupt you. How do you explain the, the geniuses? A Mozart who at four or five was composing or playing the piano. Now, if it right. doesn't come from something in the past, you know, where a child will sit down and all of a sudden, with no exposure, will be to do, do extraordinary things. There's no doubt that there are extraordinary acts of genius which, uh, and people do differ. I, I remember uh, Tom Lehrer's remark about Mozart. He said, uh, when Mozart was my age, he was dead five years. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and Lehrer said that at a quite young age. Uh, but, uh, but the thing that, uh, that I find most striking uh, is... Uh, the enormous, remarkable capability of virtually every small child for, for learning. They, they start out uh, eager, intellectually wide-eyed, uh, asking extremely clever questions about the world. And then something happens, uh, by and large, to, to discourage them. And I think it's a tremendous waste of, of natural resources. Uh, for example, a kid asks, uh, Mommy, why is the grass green? And very often you get a, uh, an answer like, oh, don't ask dumb questions, or who knows. Uh, when in fact it's an extremely profound question, and how much how much better well, why would it is be? the sky blue or anything like it, that? Yeah. In both those cases, it, it goes to the fundamentals. In one case of biology, in the other of a, of a kind of physics, how much better it would be to uh, to say to the child, uh, "That's a good question, Johnny. I don't know the answer. Maybe we can look it up." Or nobody knows. Maybe when you grow up, you'll be the person to find out. Uh, I think kids which are, who are discouraged from asking those questions wind up learning the lesson that there's something bad about using the mind and we lose resources, and we need those intellectual resources because we are in very perilous times. And I think the complex and subtle problems that we face can only have complex and subtle solutions. Right. And we need people able to think complex and subtle thoughts. And I believe a great many children have that capability if only they're encouraged. You have an interesting chapter in your book when you talk about dolphins and the great whales, which you say are probably next down the scale as far as intelligence. And you said that dolphins are communicating they may be saying things to us, and the only reason we don't understand is because we don't know how to interpret mm -hmm. what they are saying. Is it possible that the dolphins could be saying they're talking well, to us, mm -hmm. but we just don't understand what they're saying? Uh, I, I think there's a, a terrible kind of human uh, chauvinism, which, uh, you know, we look at another animal, if he doesn't do precisely what we do, we say, my goodness, what a dummy he is. And you can see that most clearly in, uh, in the studies that have been made of chimpanzees. Uh, uh, until recently, the kind of best study of the intelligence of chimps was you take a little baby chimp and raise it in the same house as a little baby baby, and uh, you, you give them both identical high chairs and potties and bibs and all that. At the end of two or three years, the chimp was, of course, uh, swinging from the rafters, tremendously good physically, dexterity, excellent, but can't say uh, hardly anything, and the, the human baby is happily babbling away. From that, people said, oh, my goodness, chimps are tremendously dumb, can't say anything. But two psychologists at the University of Nevada named Gardner had uh, uh, the idea, look, the pharynx and larynx of the chimp isn't good for language. Maybe there's a way which chimps could speak without using the voice. And they had the idea that Amislan, American Sign Language, used by mute people, uh, would be good for a chimp. And so now we have something like a dozen chimps on the earth who are 
have vocabularies in this kind of language of hundreds of words. There's a gorilla at Stanford said to have a 500-word vocabulary, <laughs> not on the football team. And <laughs> this year, <laughs> that's only because he's a freshman. <laughs> Wait till he's a senior, he'll be playing. But now, now but is that imitation, Carl? I mean. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, you, you do a sign and you show the animal what that is. Yes, so that's right. But, it. but then the animal has it in his head to and make up. puts them together in new context, new phrases. And there's tremendously interesting stories like uh, a uh, presented with a radish for the first time. I had no idea what it was. Chimp eats a radish, tastes that radish taste, and says, cry hurt food. And Cry hurt food. And for, because that's bitter the, and made bitter. It. Exactly. Now that's that's a creative response to a new environmental situation. Or the first time the chimp saw a duck land quacking in water, looks at it and says, "Water bird," which is in fact the English phrase. Um, or one case where a woman who had uh, spent a lot of time with the chimp was leaving. The chimp looked at the woman and said, "Cry me, me cry." Now. That is so close to uh, what we would recognize as intelligence in children, uh, and many hundreds of words is getting up there. Basic English is a thousand words. Does there uh, come to a point, though, mm -hmm. where between the basic words and an abstract type of uh, emotional thing? But that's it. The, um, the, they seem so close to having abstractions. In fact, in, in the Dragons of Eden, I have a chapter called The Abstractions of Beasts. And it's just exactly that, that question. Uh, there, there was, in fact, a debate in uh, English philosophy in which uh, a guy named John Locke said, uh, beasts abstract not. And uh, another philosopher named uh, Bishop Barclay said, uh, essentially, if, if that's the distinguishing characteristics of beasts, I guess uh, a lot of people I know will have to be reckoned into their number. Uh, because abstractions are not an invariant uh, accompaniment of everyday life in, yeah. in human beings. Anyway, what's, what's happening here is we're getting an idea of a continuum. Um, that it's not just that human beings are here and all the other animals are very far away. They come pretty close. They're not at all as intelligent as we are, but interestingly close. Suppose and tomorrow, real theory, mm -hmm. that all human beings disappeared from the earth mm -hmm. and it was left to just the birds, the fish, mm -hmm. the reptiles, and the animals. Do you think that they would evolve eventually into well, I think speaking... I think there's no, 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 no doubt about it. Or is that it. evolutionary pride? Have we gone no. past that? No, no, I, I think it's very likely. I mean, by and large, other things being equal, it's better to be smart than to be stupid. Uh, there are some exceptions, like when you make nuclear weapons, but uh, <laughs> before that, uh, it, uh, it obviously gives you a better chance of survival, a better chance of leaving many offspring. And uh, the question, it's an interesting question, which organism would replace us if yeah. we wiped our, ourselves selectively out? An old professor of mine, uh, H.J. Muller, geneticist, uh, said he thought it was between the raccoons and the bears. Uh, and they're both uh, very uh, clever and do many different things. But uh, my feeling is that uh, the great apes, chimps, gorillas, are so close to us already that they have a big head start if that were to happen. I hope it won't happen. And yes. The way you guarantee that it doesn't happen is by using the kind of intelligence that nature has already given us. We've only be begun to scratch the surface. It's really a fascinating book, and it's not a heavy book. It's uh, some more interesting things in there. I want to come back again, and we'll follow up on some more of this, because it's absolutely incredible, called The Dragons of Eden, Speculations on the Evolution of Human Intelligence. I said, I think the way we would really find out, we were talking about it the other day, if a dog or a porpoise dies and leaves a will, <laughs> you know, then you'd have to say, maybe we got something, right? Oh, human chauvinism, leaving yeah, a will see, is something we do, you know. So they probably look at us and say, oh, the humans probably be intelligent if they could only sing a half-hour ballad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole relative, right? <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ed. Thank, Thank you, you Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, audience.